Today we're talking about molecular gastronomy and you'll notice in a couple places in the Immersive Worlds Handbook I uh, talk about this um, field of culinary arts in reference to a couple uh, famous places. So this feature is going to talk about creativity and um, technical abilities and most of all the idea of inspiration for creative projects. So kind of what inspired this was years ago my wife and I visited the famous um, Grant Ackett's restaurant Alinea in Chicago and um, you can see some of the photos here that we took as we were eating um, some of the incredible dishes. And molecular gastronomy is a, um, if not controversial, but new field in culinary arts and uh, some people debate the merits of it but um, we found it to be absolutely amazing. And um, in addition to Alinea, you'll see in a second, we, we visit another restaurant in Chicago called Moto. What was amazing about Alinea was the sense of, of surprise and drama that was really to be found around uh, every corner as you tried the food. Uh, so here at Moto, you can see the uh, menus themselves are edible. Um, you see kind of a snowman, take on a snowman, uh, a take here on a forest with uh, uh, mushrooms, um, a couple of other uh, savory dishes, and then we move into some uh, uh, sweet dishes as well. And um, Moto really was um, also quite playful. You could see there was an edible uh, Cracker Jack uh, type dish, and the mushroom there actually is not a real mushroom. So one of the things that happens with molecular food is that there's often a play on the food and um, an attempt to really challenge the eater. Um, here you can see my uh, menu that I'm, I'm eating from uh, Moto restaurant. And what's really um, exciting about molecular cuisine and the restaurants where some of this is featured around the United States is that sense of playfulness. You could see here the drama of the food smoking while it comes out to your table. And one of the things that, here's my wife, uh, Crystal Lucas, that um, we're appreciating here is this interesting presentation of the food um, in this um, beaker that you basically see in a chemistry lab. So in addition to eating at these restaurants, um, over the last couple of years I've been inspired to look at molecular gastronomy, reading a number of texts, and there's you know easy how-to guides to incredible tomes like uh, Heston Blumenthal of The Fat Duck and his amazing cookbook. And when you read through a lot of these um, cookbooks and you get a sense of the inspiration that these uh, culinary artists, these uh, culinary geniuses take to their food, you really have um, a concept of two types of challenge that's, I think, present here. One is a technical challenge, and it's the uh, chemistry and trying to understand everything from the pH of something to um, when you should um, do something, uh, a particular technique, in order to cause a reaction to happen. So it's incredibly demanding in a technical sense. But the other thing that I appreciate about this food and what inspired me to try some of these experiments that you'll see here is the sense of creativity, the sense of challenge. And this is um, Grant Ackett's and um, some excerpts here from his book, The Alinea Cookbook, which is another amazing cookbook that really features a lot about the restaurant and also a lot, of course, about the cuisine. And then Ferran Adria, who's the uh, grand genius pictured here of uh, the now unfortunately closed El Bulli, had a chance to uh, listen to a couple audiobooks um, about his work and some of the controversies related to his uh, molecular cuisine, and then also got the wonderful tome here a day at El Bulli, which gives you a sense of everything that goes into uh, the meal, the preparation, and, and so forth. And as you start to look at molecular cuisine, as you start to gain an, an appreciation of it, I think one of the things that you see is that, like any um, space that you would visit, any immersive space you might see, it really does um, challenge both, uh, in the case of the artists, the culinary artists, to come up with new concoctions, new cuisine, new inspirations. And from a guest perspective, it also challenges you when you enter one of these restaurants. Because initially, you might have the sense that you're seeing something that you've never seen before. And in fact, that's true. In a lot of cases, molecular cuisine is playing um, tricks with you, playing tricks with the senses. Um, I've, I've written to some extent in the Immersive Worlds Handbook about the role of the senses and in the case of a molecular gastronomic restaurant like Alinea or Moto, you do get the ability to really challenge the guests and to play off the different senses. 
Well, when we talk about the equipment that's used, um, as you might imagine, the equipment is, is uh, some of it's traditional, but a lot of the equipment you use looks more like something you'd see in a chemistry lab. So you can see syringes here used to make some of the uh, agar spaghettis and other um, devices here that are used, uh, pH tests. Um, you know, it really the sky's the limit in terms of being able to um, understand what you need. And you can see some of the specialized equipment here, or chemicals rather, from uh, one of the companies, uh, Artista, and you also see some of these featured from um, the uh, Andrea brothers here. Um, these are some of their interesting um, chemicals that you use um, in the food. And uh, some people would even challenge whether or not we should be referring to these as, as chemicals because it seems to maybe demean the creative spirit. When you talk about the, uh, the process that's involved, Again, it's it's not easy, and when uh, I decided to uh, throw a party and to try some of these molecular creations, my goal was really to be challenged to see what went into the uh, the work that has been pictured in these many cookbooks. This is actually one of my um, uh, recipes that didn't work. It was an agar spaghetti, I think, made of uh, uh, Bailey's. Um, and uh, I just had a lot of difficulty really manipulating the equipment and also getting the spaghetti to uh, to work, uh, to take, and also really to taste good. And that's the other side of it is sometimes you make some stuff and it doesn't work out. This is a recipe here I tried from uh, Ferran Adriao's cookbook um, using, it was an olive uh, preparation and quite involved in terms of using uh, a chinois and at the time I didn't have a chinois so I'm using a strainer and a, a mortar and pestle here. And so it was challenging just getting to the stage of getting the olive juice. And so that maybe itself was 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and then there was a, an evolved process where you had to take the olive juice and um, add, um, I'm forgetting what I added to it, but basically a thickener. And um, then I had to make a, um, an oil. And this um, oil was um, uh, had a lot of different uh, flavors in it. And the idea was to make, you can see it didn't quite work here, um, some um, uh, spherification, so to make some spheres and to um, put those in in the oil. So a, a lot of times, I think the discovery is that you're going to fail, and you could see some of the uh, the spheres I made that didn't come out so great. And later, there are some ones. This is a particularly bad one here that came out better. And what was exciting for me working on um, the molecular cuisine was really to see the challenge at the technical and the, at the creative levels. And for any designer thinking about a space or any experience in a space, you, you often have to say, um, what is it going to take to pull this off? What is it going to take to make sure that the guest enjoys the space? And as I went through the process of this, and I thought about putting some of these back on video, it, it occurred to me that really this does tie in directly with uh, creating immersive worlds and thinking about it from both the producer's standpoint, the creator of the space, or in this case, the creator of the cuisine, and then from the guest perspective, the person who's going to actually sit down and in this case, eat some amazing new dishes. And um, so this uh, particular party here, you'll see that, that we threw, involved a number of different dishes. This one here was an easy one that involved um, a simple cornstarch, the use of cornstarch and um, some pistachios and cream cheese. And it was uh, basically finger food. And it was one of the easiest ones. And uh, I think what I learned from the molecular experiments was in some cases some of these came off great and you could maybe try some of the easier ones first and then later go for some of the more challenging uh, technical and artistic ones. This one actually came out great. It's from Grant um, Ackett's cookbook and that's not the title he uses but uh, basically this involves uh, taking um, various forms of, of lettuce and uh, processing those, blending those, and then taking um, the lettuce as well as some uh, salts uh, so remain in basically freezing this and after you freeze it so you have a transformation which is really key both in immersive spaces and in molecular cuisine what I liked about this was as each guest was was trying it they were kind of amazed to taste the lettuce but in a frozen form um, here was one of the easier ones from uh, Ferran Andrea's uh, mini cookbooks and this was making a, a spherification of uh, cantaloupe um, in, a, in a water that had, um, I believe it was cantaloupe or mango in there. The water was very easy, it was just an infusion which involved taking the peelings of either the mango, um, I think in this case it was the mango, and then putting that in the water and then you, doing the process of um, uh, using alginate and uh, calcium to uh, create the uh, spherification. So that one was, was pretty interesting and the guests kind of enjoyed it. This one was a number of um, different 
uh, recipes kind of thrown together and it involved um, quite a few different techniques um, using some uh, thickening agents and basically creating um, alternative forms of pancake and doing some spheres you see there are actually uh, butter and so um, that I had butter there and then I made a uh, kind of a frozen foam on top which um, featured maple syrup so it was the idea of doing a pancake a traditional dish but doing it in um, three different ways that maybe would surprise the palate in terms of the person eating it. This was from uh, Hessen Blumenthal's cookbook and he talked about the combination of parsley and banana. So it was uh, making a, a dessert here that involved uh, using the dehydrator, dehydrating some uh, parsley and putting that on top of the banana uh, as well as with uh, some cream. And that one was um, a somewhat easier one to do and what was neat about that was everyone enjoyed the, the combination of the parsley and the banana which I think typically in most restaurants you wouldn't um, have that. You wouldn't even have those maybe in the same course in terms of a savory and a sweet. Um, this uh, this one here was um, maybe my favorite one, and it's also from Grant Ackett's uh, Alinea Cookbook. And it was basically uh, taking English cucumber, um, freezing it, adding some uh, a thickening agent to that, and then in each corner, in the middle, there's a pistachio, and in each corner, there's some different elements. You have cayenne there in the left corner, um, left bottom, left top. You have some um, orange rind. Uh, you have on the right there, I believe, lemon. And I'm trying to remember in the, in the top right corner. But the idea there was to have four different elements, and it went really well. This one actually wasn't as successful from the perspective of the guest standpoint or the eater standpoint. Um, it was a really neat process, though, using the dehydrator and creating these little clouds are uh, basically out of uh, root beer. And um, what was neat about it was that the, the texture of the little floating thing was so similar to a packing peanut. And um, when people were eating it, they said, yeah, definitely tastes like a, or it, it reminds me of the texture of a packing peanut, um, but to a person I don't think anyone actually said they enjoyed the taste or the flavors. Some people actually said it was kind of bad. Um, this was using um, some uh, ingredients here to actually try to create again some alterations in, in perception and it created this uh, wind that was similar to what I did with the pancake. So it involved a lot of freezing and trying to really prepare it and have it ready uh, such that um, the guests of the party could actually enjoy it. So this was one of those timing ones that was a challenge and sometimes uh, in an immersive space or certainly in a restaurant you get a sense that uh, timing is, is a key element and, and timing often uh, depends on your success of pulling things off uh, for the guest. This one here, this picture of uh, Slavov Zizek, the philosopher, and, it, and I just called this the Colonel, and it was a little fizzy from the Andrea um, collection, and it was called a surprise, and the idea was that you would put this in your mouth, and it was, if you remember the um, Pop Rocks as kids, it was basically just uh, caramel chocolate coated Pop Rock, and it was served in this giant plate, and it was trying to be playful and more conceptual. And one of the things I love about molecular um, gastronomy is the idea that you can play with people's minds, you can really challenge their perceptions, and you could see here at the party how we presented some of this. Um, but that sense of conception I think for me is one of the greatest things about molecular gastronomic cuisine, both trying to pull off some of these incredibly challenging dishes and also enjoying some of the dishes in Alinea and Moto, is the sense that these are artists who are really trying to challenge us to think about things in a new way. So um, I hope you enjoy this, this little feature and I'll um, offer you a few additional ones later on more aspects of molecular cuisine.